Hello, and welcome to another fully live Friday episode of Hacking with Friends. My name is Cody Kinsey. I'm a security researcher at Veronis, and today we have my good friend and fellow hacker, Alex, here to go over the security news. Alex, thanks for joining us today. Of course, it's great to be here. So we are riding out, I think, day three of a historic heat wave in Los Angeles. So if anybody else is going through that as well, then um, I'm sorry. Uh, but otherwise, it's been a pretty productive week. Uh, and we got to do a really fun Q&A stream with MG, the creator of the OMG cable, earlier, uh, along with the product launch of the new Elite OMG cable. So that was really awesome. Yeah, you guys can check that out on uh, the Hack 5 show as well as also here if you want to rewatch that. Yeah. That was really cool. Uh, he introduced us to like two new features he's been working on, one of which is uh, the C2 service, which is going to be really exciting to see. Some of the other Hack5 products have had C2 integration for a long time. Of course, there's the custom Hack5 C2 page, but it looks like they're also now implementing that on the OMG cable um, in conjunction with some other really cool features. Um, I forgot what the newest one was, but of course, there's like key logging. Oh, there's some new like side channel attacks that were pretty interesting. Hmm. Um, of course, there was also like the recent revealing of um, the keystroke reflection attack as it's dubbed on the new USB rubber ducky. But from what I from what we heard from MG, they're implementing something that's in a similar vein to that. Yeah. So if you switch over to my screen, you can see we have the uh, Hack5 website with the Elite Early Access OMG cable. And this is really cool. So if you were considering getting one of the Elite versions, um, and you weren't quite sure what it does, or, or you had some more questions, then you should definitely check out the Q&A stream. I really love when we get the creators of these products on and our people can you know, ask them straight up questions like before making their purchase or after making their purchase, like find out about like how to do interesting and weird things with it. So it was really great having MG on. And uh, yeah, if you were considering grabbing one of the new Elite OMG cables, then you can find out more information about it by checking out the Q&A stream, both on Security Forward and also on the Hack5 channel. Oh yeah. <clears throat> So it's also been a lot of really cool things just uh, circulating and buzzing around Hack5 products recently. There's like a lot of hot new stuff that's been released. Like, of course, the Wi-Fi Coconut being their latest product, the latest rubber ducky and stuff like that. Um, I've been working with the Coconut for a little bit personally. Um, and it's really cool to see also some mods and stuff like that that's that I've just been seeing on like Twitter. Um, the documentation is also very straightforward. Just yesterday, I got the Coconut working with... Uh, Kismet, and I also tried out like Wireshark and some other things like that. Trying to find um, some pictures on my Twitter feed, but I've been seeing some pretty cool mods that people are doing to their coconut, where they're slapping like external antennas and GPS <laughs> onto it. And I really want to try that out for war driving because it's really cool to have like comprehensive 14 channel reconnaissance in like an all in one platform. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. really cool. So if you haven't heard about the uh, Wi-Fi Coconut, it is a reconnaissance platform that works really, really well, well with Kismet, and it monitors all 2.4 gigahertz channels simultaneously. It's really awesome, and we're looking at doing some more videos on both using it and setting it up. Um, so Alex, any nugget news this week? Yeah, so the first thing that comes to mind, uh, next week I'm going to be hosting a USB attack workshop around the USB nugget. So if you guys are in the Los Angeles area and you want to learn how to do cool stuff on your Nugget, I'm going to be covering um, some advanced Ducky script payloads on the USB Nugget, but I'm going to be doing pretty much everything comprehensively from like how to get started with Ducky script all the way down to um, some example payloads. So I'll cover stuff like uh, basic reconnaissance, data exfiltration, um, maybe like file system enumeration, stuff like that. If you guys are interested, um, you switch over to my screen can just go over to my Twitter page, which is twitter.com slash Alex Lind. Uh, and if you check out my pinned tweet, this should redirect you to the universe link where you can buy a ticket to that workshop. So if you want to learn more, this will, this would be the best place to find that info. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think in the future, we also talked about like maybe doing some of these workshops online. So if anybody's interested in that and you are not interested in, Los, uh, interested in living in the, in the heat wave of Los Angeles as well, then uh, hit us up and let us know. Uh, and we could potentially host one of these online as well. Um, we just have access to a really great hacker space called Null Space Labs in Los Angeles, and we love to promote them anytime that we get a chance to. And also a portion of the tickets goes towards uh, just keeping the place open and like making it available for other hackers. So it's really great to do one of these workshops whenever, uh, whenever Alex gets a chance out here. Yeah. Um, all right, so what other, what other nugget news do we have? Um, 
let's see, we published our documentation site, which is pretty cool. Hopefully we'll have some more projects and stuff like that coming out. If you check out usbnugget.com, that's at least, oh, I typed that in wrong. I'm gonna switch over to my screen. That's, a, that's at least where you can find uh, the latest news um, for USB Nugget related stuff that we're gonna be pushing in the near future. Um, as for the Wi-Fi Nugget, we're also trying to aim some more of our development effort towards that product as well, since a lot of you guys bought that at DEF CON. Um, yeah, do you have any Nugget news? Um, so we are bringing on a new developer, which is really exciting. And um, shout out to our friend Angelina, who's been around helping us out with workshops and now uh, doing embedded like programming stuff. Oh, yeah. um, but trying to get her set up with like Docker on like a Mac OS system, like flashing to an Espressif device is like a multi-step process. So I was up late last night um, working with one of our developers, trying to figure out like why it was so difficult to get like Docker set up to like flash the stuff on a Mac OS system. So we are uh, working on making it a little bit easier for people who are trying to like work with uh, the Nugget or uh, contribute to be able to just like build something with Docker really easily. And it works great on Linux, but uh, as of right now, we are still getting it up and running on Mac OS. So that was a really fun adventure to get familiar with Docker again. Oh. Yeah. So I have some non-nugget news. If we switch over to my screen, a dark day has come and Dougal.com uh, is down. No, oh, no. So since the beginning of Nullbyte, I've needed a good neutral example website that I can go to that nobody's going to get upset about. And my go-to has been Dougal.com, which has been um, hosting this weird letter to somebody named Tom about a conversation that two men had over a pint of beer. Um, and this was apparently an email that was sent and then has just been taking up this uh, this domain for a really long time. Um, originally, it was registered in 1998 as Dougal Digital. And uh, since 2014, it's been hosting this uh, Venn diagram about knowing God intellectually versus knowing God through acceptance and experience. Um, and I love this example of website. It's simple. It's got a pie chart. It's, you know, nobody's going to get mad at me. And as of um, as of a couple of days ago, it is now officially down after hosting this since 2014. So pour one out for Dougal, uh, my very most favorite example website, and also a website with an extraordinarily high amount of traffic just because of people misspelling google.com. So uh, yeah, I really love this website. I'm very sad to see it go. And um, that was a very sad day for me when google.com went down. And I'm kind of afraid to go to it now, but as you can see, the account's been suspended and Tom oh. no longer has guidance, which is, hey. I'm I'm worried about him. Uh, so also, this is just kind of jumping into the news. Uh, this was one thing I noted on Twitter this week. Uh, by 2026, all federally funded research results should be freely available to the public without delay, um, which is something that has been plaguing scientific journals for a long time. There's been this whole paywall thing. Like, have you ever tried to get a scientific journal? Nope. Really? Never in your whole short life have you tried to peep into the results of a scientific study? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, Sorry. so so it goes something like this. You'll you'll see a scientific study that's really interesting um, with results that are really interesting, and then you'll try to look at it, and then some private company will pop up a paywall and force you to pay. Now, this annoys a lot of academics because they publish their papers not to make some random third-party company money. They publish their paper because they want to serve the public good. So a lot of uh, researchers I know, like Matthew Van Hoff, for example, publish all of his work on his own website, free and clear, so anybody can read it because you know that's what he uh, that's what he wants to do. So um, right now, it is very difficult sometimes for you to get access to some of this like publicly funded research without paying some private company. And I think that it is awesome that the United States government has taken the view that you know if taxpayer money uh, is involved in actually like doing these studies, then the results should definitely, definitely be available to everybody without enriching some random third party company. So this is uh, really great news uh, for anybody who wants to be able to get access to cutting edge information without having to go through a payroll or have to like hack through some like dumb paywall, um, because that's currently the case that a lot of people have to do if they want to get access to like top tier scientific information. I was digging for a very specific tweet and I think I misunderstood what you were asking me, but yes, I actually have, there's a particular um, extension that I use to get past like certain well-known websites that have like paywalls and that kind of thing. Um, my high school credentials for whatchamacallit, I forget, there's a there's a particular, oh, JSTOR. That's usually where I do most of my like research and I have access to like scientific articles and stuff hmm. like that. That you need like a paid account for, but for some reason my high school credentials still work for that. So <laughs> when I need access to that kind of stuff, I either have the extension or I, I just have that available, so. Hmm. 
I did find the coconut mods that I was looking for. Oh, yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, so this is really cool. Um, this person, Loza Ning on Twitter, um, is doing a GPS mod to their coconut, which is really dope. I wanted to do something similar. Um, since the coconut is basically a glorified Wi-Fi dongle, it's like 14 dongles packed into one. Um, you need a host machine in order to power and communicate with this thing. And then also if you want to add on um, any other peripherals like a, uh, a GPS dongle or something like that, you need to plug that into the host computer. Luckily, this thing has a whole bunch of USB hub chips built into it. So a couple of these ports are unoccupied. And basically what this person did was just solder on a GPS module via USB to their coconut. Um, and I think they got it working. I can't, I can't find the picture of that. But what I was thinking is a modification that I wanted to do with this besides adding on GPS was also just slapping on an SBC like a Raspberry Pi Zero or like um, some other single board computer to this and having like a portable battery pack. So basically you just have like a puck that has like the built-in computer, these 14 Wi-Fi radios and then hmm. also GPS. I think that would be super, super dope. Hmm. Um, we also got a weird question on uh, the Q&A a couple days ago where someone asked in theory if it's possible to like tether this to a Wi-Fi pineapple. So of course the pineapple can operate as like a standalone thing. It's basically just a computer um, with Wi-Fi dongles on it. That I also want to try. Uh, should be possible. And then here you can also see a pretty common modification. Some people are doing just adding on a external SMA adapter so you can get longer range Wi-Fi with this thing. Hmm. That's I, pretty I wonder if you could then also put like a directional one and make yeah. it a monitor for like a specific building. So it's yeah. like only listening to Wi-Fi activity <laughs> on all 14 channels in a specific place. Yeah, this seems super dope. Uh, I've seen some like teardowns of this product. <clears throat> Apparently, there's also like 14 different UFL ports um, or UFL connectors like all around it for each of the um, antennas, but they're all tethered to like a central one that this uh, thing is connected to. <clears throat> the issue is if you want to, since it's like a passive reconnaissance device, if you want to do like an active attack, you run the risk of basically like frying the radios. I was wondering if it's possible to like cut the traces and then hook up like individual antennas to each of those and then use it for um doing some more like offensive attacks like deauthentication or something i think that'd be pretty cool but these are really intriguing um it's something i want to do when i have time so a couple comments from the chat one rip Dougal, may you forever blaze i agree i agree thank you very much another person was asking uh, that does not look like the lenovo you were using before um have you finally gone mac no <laughs> oh really um, this looks like a very nice uh lenovo computer this looks like a very expensive paperweight just oh. kidding. I actually haven't gotten used to the Mac OS interface, but uh, I'm borrowing this one from Cody because the other one kept crashing too frequently and uh, I, I couldn't put up with it. Yeah, Alex breaks computers. So it's we've true. just given him yet another it's computer to break. So it's, it, this is only a new computer, like as a like a Goodwill outfit is a new outfit or like a hand-me-down phone is a new phone. Um, this is just about my old laptop that I've done plenty of bad things with. And uh, Alex now has been charged to do more bad things with it as well. Yes. Um, so... Yeah, uh, for streaming and stuff, like it's often Mac OS is just a, like a nice platform for streaming. Like it's really easy to work with. Things just tend to be set up correctly when it comes to the drivers and everything. When you're trying to do this on Linux, sometimes it can get very complicated as you add new hardware that hasn't been connected to the system before. So just to simplify everything, at least for streaming, we are using Mac OS equipment. Um, someone else asked, when are we warshipping Alex to Puerto Rico? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was due for Connecticut or which state was it? Some guy. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's, let's move on to the next question. Um, Do you to be that? determined. Oh, we know Chicago. <clears throat> Some guy asked me to be his teddy bear and to come to Chicago with him. Someone else says war skating is only going to result in broken laptops. It's only fair occupational hazard. Yeah. I actually had an idea for another uh, war skating episode I want to do with the coconut. So maybe, <laughs> maybe that'll happen. Who knows? All right, so one thing that I wanted to shout out. Um, so Alex, do you know what Bellingcat is? Yeah, I know vaguely of them. Yeah, so over on my screen, you can see Bellingcat is a organization that does a lot of um, really good training for journalists. They also do a lot of investigations themselves, but they're really well known for it in their investigative tactics. And they are holding some hackathons. So these hackathons are for people who want to build tools um, for OSINT. And this is something that I've kind of just done in my spare time before. Like I've gone through like the city of Los Angeles's data catalog and built tools for like accessing uh, or searching through their API, you know, just like really basic stuff that I thought was like kind of dumb, 
but then like journalists actually love because they can just download my script and run it and boom, they get access to all this information about, you know, like various like businesses in the city of Los Angeles. So if you like to tinker with data and if you are someone who likes to, you know, build tools, then they are hosting these hackathons um, over the course of a couple of days. So one of them is actually already underway. It's starting today um, and it's the second to the fourth. And it's going to be focusing on social media network analysis tools. You can apply using this form right here. Um, and it looks like it's closed. Mm -hmm. All right. So but that's probably because it's uh, it's starting today. Let's see. Can we do this one? So this one starts on the 16th. And yes, this one's actually still open. OK, cool. Um, so anyway, uh, if you wanted to sign up for these, you can uh, check them out. All in all, I think this is a really interesting push to get people like interested in like creating OSINT tools as well as using them. Because frankly, like I'm not a great computer scientist and I was able to make some things that like, yeah, a bunch of people deem to be useful. Um, so, you know, if that's something you're interested in, then there you go. Nice. Speaking of OSINT, this was actually a repository that I was looking at just earlier today. So recently I've been looking into rather recently github has been recommending me a bunch of these like dumb compiled lists of different things in this case a curated list of like different osint tools um i myself haven't done a lot of work in osint i know you've done quite a few things probably more than i have but this list of tools seems pretty interesting if you guys are at all wanting to look into some different tools and stuff you guys can screw around with um <laughs> the github repository j i v o i slash awesome osint seems to have a pretty solid uh, compilation here. Cool. So one of the latest pieces of content we put out on Hack5 is actually yours, Alex. Do you want to talk oh, about yeah. the sneaky password exfiltration episode, which I have yeah. up on my screen? I was just about to talk about that. Yeah. So this was a demonstration that I made for the USB nugget. Um, it was sort of a joint demonstration of um, how you could steal a root password from a Linux device um, using keystroke injection, and also how you can use a free online honeypot service called Canary Tokens for data exfil. So basically the demonstration that I did was I had a USB nugget, which is our flagship keystroke injection product that's shaped like a cat. If you guys don't have one, you can pick it up at hackcat.com. Um, but I created a payload in a previous video showing how you could create an alias for a Linux uh, root input and basically steal the Linux password, dump it out to a file in plain text. And then from there, you could do whatever you want with that. Um, in this demonstration, I extended that by allowing the payload to also exfiltrate that password. So if you want to send that password remotely over the net, um, the way you would do that is you can use this tool called Canary Tokens um, in order to encode that password or maybe some other sensitive data that you stole from this presumed Linux device, encode it into an HTTP header, and then um, remotely extract and do whatever you want with that data. So if you go to canarytokens.com. Um, .org. Is it .com? I think it redirects. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, canarytokens.org. This is an awesome website um, that hosts a variety of different honeypot solutions. So basically, you can create stuff like a bugged Microsoft Word document or images or URLs or stuff like that. And the point behind this is it's meant to be really easy for you to get alerts if like maybe a hacker compromises your system and is enumerating for um, like documents or images or stuff like that. But in my demonstration, I showed a way that you could um, twist the service to also um, use the incident dashboard as a way of monitoring exfiltrated data. Actually, if you want to check out my website um, at alexlin.com slash blog, I put out a pretty short walkthrough um, of how this works, basically how you can use Canary tokens for creating some of these different bug formats and also um, some other cool use cases of that, as well as a walkthrough of this particular demonstration. So yeah, and also make sure to check out the video on Hack5 if you want a more in-depth explanation of how that works. Yeah, so far 8,378 views and um... Yeah, all crimes are illegal. I'm glad that you pointed that out. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then somebody else actually had a question that we can answer real quick. Um, it, what's the best ESP32 board for this project, the S2 or the S3 or the first one? I'm not sure what the first one is, but yeah. uh, 
I'd probably recommend the S2. That's what we're rocking on the Nuggets. Um, they support native USB, which means you can do stuff like keystroke injection attacks. Um, it's definitely a step up from the first iteration of the ESP32. As for the S3, I'm not so sure about that one. I know they added Bluetooth functionality. I believe it still supports native USB as well. I yep. personally haven't gotten to try anything with it. Um, what does suck though is the form factor that we're using, which is um, created by, I believe, Wallen or Wemos or whatever they're called now. They don't have a form factor for this quite yet, so I haven't had any incentive to try slapping one onto a nugget. But if I ever do, I'll let you know. For now, the S2 is what we're supporting. Um, all right, so another thing that I wanted to point out uh, that is just like a, a weird thing we're probably going to do an episode on in the future is I did not know until fairly recently that uh, the like AirPods like that Apple offers can actually be individually tracked, like each pod itself can be tracked. So when you get one of these devices, you're actually getting effectively three trackers, um, because if you were to separate them, you would be able to track the individual one's path as well as the main case, which to me is pretty crazy. So um, we happened to just find one oh, like at a coffee shop and just realized that as an Android user, like you could pick up this item, but it will always be haunted by some random man named Neem. And he could just show up at any moment furious that you have these things. So often some of these smart devices, like people don't know that, you know, in like find my device, you can actually see the location of the individual like AirPods, for example. Uh, a lot of these like tracked devices um, people don't realize they could be tracked by. So if someone were to give you a pair of AirPods, or if you were to find some, you might not realize that your every motion could be tracked by this. So we're probably going to end up uh, doing an episode on this because I have AirPods myself, and I think it's really funny that I can see like where just one of the pods is going. Uh, so we might uh, do an episode on tracking with seemingly inanimate objects uh, in the next Hack 5 uh, flagship kind of like a episode pattern. So if nice. you're interested in this, like, let us know. We've been doing some tracking stuff and I, I still think it's very funny um, that random objects can be used to uh, like give away your location. I'm not sure if it's the case for the second or third gen AirPods, but I was looking into like guides for how to reset these AirPods hypothetically. But if you just like hold down the button for 15 seconds, apparently it unpairs it from find my devices and also like factory resets them, which is interesting. Yeah. So not exactly a robust defense, but if the devices are away from each other, like for example, if the, if the ear pods are separated from the base station, then that reset's not really going to take very well, um, yeah. at least for like all the devices. And there are still some uh, options to like lock it to your account. So it can't mm -hmm. be registered with another account. So mm -hmm. if you're an Android user, probably no impact. But if you are an iOS user and you're trying to use them on an iOS device with all the nice features, you're probably going to find that you'll have to pair them with your account. And then because they're currently paired with another person's account, um, there's going to be a conflict there because Apple will take care of that stuff. So as an Android user, that might actually work. But as a like a Mac user, you are still probably going to run into some problems trying to take like a effectively like a lost or stolen item and then use it in the same ecosystem. You may possibly get into a physical altercation with Hanin. Yes. Sorry, yeah. Neen. Oh, Neen. All right. All right, so uh, this is something that's getting a lot of attention right now in the security community, and that's Cloudflare's position on hateful content. So um, they have taken the stance that they are not going to uh, they are not going to deny service to a website that is openly calling for like harassment and violence against trans people, um, and that is obviously an unpopular position. But they have um, so I'm I'm good friends with a with a public relations lady at uh, at our our. Or my day job, and we we really like to like look at just maybe not great examples of you know like uh, of corporate messaging. And in this case, um, explaining that they have a like a carbon offset for hatred um, has been their method of responding to this crisis. Um, I am almost sure that no public relations company was involved in like approving or looking at the statement first, but I could be wrong. Maybe this is a great strategy, and I'm just missing it somewhere. But as somebody who is affected by this like i don't feel particularly great about the fact that a website is being put up that's like advocating for like violence against people who've done really nothing wrong and um the the trade-off for that is like a thousand dollars is being donated to the, like the trevor project like that doesn't really feel good for me especially and um i'm not gonna cite the specific website that they are providing services for uh but they're providing some services for some extremely hateful websites and they're idea of like pink washing this by like kind of like making a donation and then being like no it's fine like you know like providing a platform for 
you know, people to like spread these incredibly hateful views against vulnerable people. Like that, that's totally fine. Um, this is a debate that's going to be ongoing for a while. It's not a position a lot of companies want to be in defending like neo-Nazis and people like calling for like violence. Um, it, it's a, a very sketchy position. So obviously there's a lot of nuance here, but a lot of the security community and also a lot of rights organizations are pretty upset about this like carbon offset for hatred uh, idea because it's not smart, uh, at least in my opinion, it's super dumb. So uh, apparently, like they also just like randomly deplatformed like smaller um, websites that they also thought were like purportedly like doing like hate stuff, which was kind of stupid. A while back, I also saw like some controversy about that, but yeah, I think it's like really stupid also that they're just like completely doubling down. Yeah. So again, these are but, these are our opinions. Yeah. We don't represent anyone else. It, it just is a very big response in both the security community and also in the like rights community um that uh this is now something where this kind of like niggling position in the middle where it's just like yeah like it's okay but like no that's not okay but for this we're gonna like make a donation um it's tricky to be a provider in this circumstance but i would say uh this scheme is not smart and is not going to solve the problem so stay tuned to see how this one's going to play out it looks like there's a tremendous amount of pressure uh, on this company to do something about this particular instance and it looks like that pressure is not going to go away anytime soon because their uh, statement, public statements about this have only inflamed the problem. Lame. Yes. Um, all right. So you want to go into some news on your end? Yeah. Let's so we got it. some uh, questions in the chat um, regarding some wireless reconnaissance type stuff. Do you have any plans on doing anything with SDR? Uh, maybe like an RTL SDR blog. And then someone else says, I would like to know more about Bluetooth slash Wireshark wire stuff. This is another aspect really curious about. Hmm. I do have some Wi-Fi specific stuff um, that I'm going to be covering um, hopefully soon, specifically with the Wi-Fi coconut and also integrations with tools like TCP dump, T-Shark, Wireshark, um, stuff like that. Recently, I've also been messing around a little bit with um, the Ubertooth, which is like a 2.4 gigahertz dongle that you can use for like enumerating Bluetooth, devi enumerating, like, Bluetooth devices um, and stuff like that. And I've also wanted to pick up my RTL SDR but I haven't had uh, any incentive to do that recently, just with like how much other stuff I'm doing. But that is something I might look into because that very much interests me as well. Yeah, um, on, on that question also, like I was doing a piece on police body cameras for a while because they're also Bluetooth devices that never change their MAC address. So like because they're worn by police officers pretty much ubiquitously, I actually had the, the chance to interview someone from Axon, the company that makes those body cameras and be like, is there a reason you guys like never change these MAC addresses? And they're just like, what, why would, what? They're just out there. They're wearing they're wearing uniforms, you know. Like, who cares if people can see them? I'm like, but like wirelessly, like yeah. you know, from like blocks away. Like that's that's okay. And they're like, J just just be quiet. <laughs> I mean, like they were they were nice about it, and they're like, listen, like we don't see this as like a serious vulnerability. Like police officers are already in public. I'm like, what about what about ones that are like undercover though? You know, and maybe have the body camera on in case they arrest a guy. But like you know, they're sitting in a car or something. Like, do you think that would maybe like give them away? I don't know. Like, there's there's lots of implications for not only like AirPods and being able to track those sorts of devices, but any device that doesn't change its MAC address. That could yeah. be a car stereo. That could be like a, a dash cam. That could be like headphones that are just always putting up the same MAC address. Like all those things could potentially be used to track you if they don't rotate their MAC address on a regular basis. And a lot of them just don't. Yeah. As for um, someone asked about a compiled like GitHub repo, like the one I showed earlier, but for Wi-Fi hacking tools. I honestly just searched up like GitHub compiled Wi-Fi hacking tools and this pretty cool repository popped up. Um, this one just seems to be like a bunch of Git sub modules that dump um, a bunch of open source tools into like a central repository. You can find this at a 0x bit x slash Wi-Fi hacking tools. I've used um, a few of these. You can see there's like WPA crack. Um, there's some Wi-Fi phishing portals, um, air crack, some classic ones on there, Kismet, stuff like that. It's honestly pretty easy to find uh, some of these compiled resources, but this one looks pretty comprehensive. Um, and I can lend credence to some of these tools having used them before. Nice. All right, so over on my screen, we have an interesting case of criminals um, stabbing each other in the back. So there's an economy that is primarily targeted towards criminals who might not be very technical, but do have just enough crime money to keep their schemes going. So this is something where a developer would create a tool that's designed to be used by uh, less less talented cyber criminals and charge them between $100 a month 
or $700 per year or a $900 lifetime subscription. Now, what does this subscription get them? What do they actually receive for this? Well, they receive this beautiful built for scamming print stealer and it will automatically create their bots API tokens, their chat IDs, and it will be able to use infrastructure like Telegram chats and, and other very common, easy to set up things to do cyber crime. So they send this to their, they send the resulting blob to their victim, it infects the victim, and then they're able to pull the strings remotely. Sounds pretty cool, right? Well, here's the problem. If you're not the person actually developing the malicious software, then you have no idea what's actually going on inside of it. And it's a pretty predictable thought that perhaps maybe you might be double crossed by the person who is making the software. And instead of just being content with taking your $200 or your $900 lifetime subscription as a VIP member, of course, um, maybe they want to take all your stuff too. So it turns out that uh, the software that they are selling also contains a back door. And the, the goal for this is twofold. One, if you are using, as a cyber criminal, this tool to go and attack other victims, then the author of the tool is just going to sit behind you and take all your loot. So as soon as you manage to scam a victim and get their like banking details, they're going to get a copy. And if they move a little bit faster than you, they're going to be able to drain that victim's bank account and hit them before you, you can. So this is a pretty sneaky attack because it, it's basically selling this tool to criminals, letting them do the work and take the uh, take the exposure and then if they happen to get lucky with it just taking their stuff uh so it also is using a tool a very old tool that was like made in i think it's like 2014 or maybe it's 2017 yeah 2017 called loda rat have you heard of nice. loda rat no, I haven't heard of yeah that. great tool um so loda rat is a remote access tool that's designed to like sit and be persistent and exfiltrate via telegram um it also will start a cnc communication with and i'm not making this up big daddy dash service dot biz or as a backup and again i'm not making this up daddy dot link pc dot net <laughs> nice. so uh yeah so um i can't even there's like four jokes i can't make on this channel but yeah so uh it, it looks as though um the people who are now like using the service are obviously going to go elsewhere uh, and get other tools, but any of these tools could potentially be backdoored to do something similar to this. And of course, some of these some of these cyber criminals also might be victimized by this loader rat gathering things, like cryptocurrency addresses or wallet addresses or, or other things that could be used to scam them. So in some cases, the cyber criminals here that are trying to buy tools to go scam innocent victims are instead tragically and upsettingly becoming the victims of these tools themselves. How um, how surprising. If only there was something we could do to predict a scenario like this. Uh, yeah, so just another funny story of cyber criminals um, really just messing each other up uh, by being greedier and greedier. Nice. I support the part where they take money from uh, other from, cyber yeah. criminals. Yeah, but not so much the part where they take the banking details as well. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be cool if they like if they donated a charity or something. That would, that I would be behind from it. innocent victims. No, They're... not the not the victim. Part. Uh, right, right, right. Just okay, like scamming okay. the scammers. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, backstabbing. Yeah. All right. So um, I've got another one. Um, this one is about Montenegro. So have you heard about what's happening here? No, I haven't. All right. So Montenegro is a relatively small country. They're a NATO <laughs> country. And it looks as though, at least according to them, um, they have been under attack by Russian cybercrime organized groups. Um, <clears throat> So false flag operations are very common uh, where like one cybercrime group will like pretend to be another group uh, and how sophisticated these false flag op uh, operations are um, really depends. You know, sometimes they'll go really far to make it look like, you know, another group that's trying to be sneaky. And other times they'll just call themselves the Cuba ransomware group and just slap a big old Cuban flag on all their ransomware stuff and be like, no, we are from Cuba. Trust us. Like we're definitely from Cuba. So um, there's not a lot. <clears throat> there's not a lot of like ransomware groups that like actively advertise like where that like where they're from, um, or act as though they're like the tourism agency for like Cuba, like in their branding. Um, so it is a little suspicious that like this ransomware group has been almost exclusively targeting the United States and now has like started pivoting to like NATO allies. Like that as um, that as like a past history, like really speaks to like an organized cybercrime group that is like maybe not operating with the interests of Cuba. Um, so 
this because it's got more of like a international attack style like a cast to it now is being investigated by a lot of like nato allies i believe there's like an fbi team that's been like dispatched to like try to figure out like what's going on here but a lot of government services have been shut down and there's a 10 million dollar ransom and the ransomers are claiming that they have everything from source code to like special proprietary information they've gathered gathered from the system um and it looks like the uh ransomware group has now added live victim support uh, so they're really starting to spin up their uh, their kind of like attack apparatus and be able to basically like take on some of the roles of these cybercrime groups that have been broken up after they got a tremendous amount of activity. So yeah, um, this has also been notable because they've been using a novel tool set that hasn't been used before. They're using tactics that are very sneaky. Uh, so it's very likely that this is a well-resourced cybercrime organization that we've seen before, but it's just operating under a new name. All right, what do you got, Alex? <laughs> oh, oh. Ah, tiny cough yeah all right <laughs> tiny cough for a guy like me all right so, so can you make that bigger yeah cool sick yeah so air gap uh, air gap research is something that's uh piqued my interest recently and i've also seen um some coverage of this particular researcher um popping up in the news on bleeping computer hacker news and stuff like that um, this interesting piece here is called Etherled, which is basically just using um, the LED indicators on Ethernet ports or even other devices like network attached storage devices or basically anything else that has an indicator on it as a side channel attack or a way of exfiltrating data. So this one um, is a little bit of a stretch in terms of how practical this would be for data exfiltration, but this particular um, side channel air gap attack allows you to basically just toggle on and off the LED indicator on various devices that are built or built into or attached to computers and use this to just exfiltrate data via Morse code. And the way that you can retrieve this is maybe you have access to something like a IP camera or something else um, that's able to have direct line of sight to something like in this case, this network interface card on the back of this computer, and then later use that footage in order to decode um, whatever information it is you're trying to exfiltrate. So of course, this can be kind of slow. Um, in terms of practicality, um, when you think about it, this might not be really that feasible because that would require you to physically compromise the computer, probably install some sort of like kernel module or something to actually overwrite um, whatever is like driving one of these cards or other hardware devices, and then have access to like a separate video system in order to monitor this. This might be practical maybe in a case where you have like physical access to a computer and then maybe access to like an IP camera that you can access over Wi-Fi or something like that. But I don't see why you could, why you wouldn't be able to use like another side channel attack given that you have like physical um, access to one of these machines, but still um, a pretty cool proof of concept, um, pretty novel. One that we saw published about two weeks ago, this one, um, <laughs> it's also pretty cool. Again, attacking air gap systems, but this time using SATA cables. So with the frequency that these operate on or are like transmitting data on, you can I'm basically- sorry, does that say this cable have a, have a snake tongue? Yeah, the attack was dubbed- Stock, stock photos are running wild. <laughs> the attack was dubbed Satan, so SATA with N. Okay. So I, I guess it's like a you snake tongue given it friggin' something. horns, but all right, yeah. go on. Yeah, but basically SATA cables can be used um, as like, an antenna in order to transmit data um, over the air. So I thought this one was actually pretty cool. I didn't get to read too much into this one. Can make it a little bigger? Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, cool. But given that you're able to physically compromise the computer, which is entirely possible and we've seen happen with, you know, attacks like Stuxnet or stuff like that. If you're able to physically compromise this computer, maybe install um, like kernel modules or something like that, you're able to use the SATA cable in order to transmit data um, over the six gigahertz frequency. And here you can see this uh, proof of concept where they were able to exfiltrate a secret um, completely wirelessly, just using this thing that's typically used to power hard drives. So you can so, also check out some of- oh. So is this like the OMG cable of SATA cables? Uh, it can be done on any SATA cable, but kind of, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, you can also check out some of the other uh, air gap researcher by this a uh, particular guy, Dr. Mordecai Guri. Um, I got to read some of these, they're pretty cool. Um, but yeah, air gap attacks are pretty cool because typically 
Um, these are systems that are supposed to be secure because they're not directly like attached to a network um, and in theory shouldn't allow for data exfiltration. So that's what makes these attacks interesting is the fact that using some of these side channel attacks, you're still able to sneak data out of a system. So now I'm confused. When you say that I can use any cable um, for this attack, like I was imagining that when you say you have physical access to the to the computer, you're swapping the cable out for like a different cable. Oh no, given that you can compromise. So this proof of concept is demonstrated on an air gap computer. So obviously you can't attack this computer over like a network connection. I hate these ads. Yeah. You can't attack this computer over a network connection per se because they aren't connected to a network intentionally. Yeah. So the only way to compromise it is with physical access. So in theory, if you have like maybe a ducky or something, you drop um, a payload onto here and then you can install a program that allows you to modulate um, data over this SATA cable. Um, and basically the computer thinks it's like writing to like a hard drive or something like that, which it's connected to, but it's actually just like emulating um, data or rather uh, like beaconing data over six gigahertz, which you can sniff with like a radio device. Okay. So it's not something that you have to like physically. Yeah, yeah, that's sorry, install. that was, that was yeah. a little unclear. Okay, right, yeah. so, so like, yeah, these are usually hooked by... up to like an internal hard drive. Yeah, well, of course, that's what I said. Yeah. yeah, so so my question was just like whether it was the cable that was being replaced or whether like it was software being run on it that was assuming it was like a poorly shielded cable was able to like create like a weak Wi-Fi signal that could be picked up. Um, right. from some some distance away? Yeah, I think uh, they were able to get like 10 meters or something, or maybe close to, cannot be greater than 120 centimeters, unfortunately. Otherwise, oh. yeah, it compromises the integrity. All right, 120 centimeters. All right, yeah. oh, okay, cool. And so also it's subject to being jammed fairly easily as well, which sucks. So, you know, yeah. of course, it's just like a regular cable. It's not like an entire antenna apparatus. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah, so I was, um, I was, I was a little confused initially, but that makes sense. So like, yeah. so being able to like beacon out over like a, like a short period after in, like infecting the computer effectively with something is pretty cool. That's, right. that's interesting. Yeah. The key here to most of these is it requires you to physically compromise the computer, like be an actual proximity to it, like plug in some like sketchy thing into it and then run one of these attacks. Um, but yeah, there's a variety of different ones here that use some interesting methods, uh, Wi-Fi, the SATA cable, stuff like that. Oh, screen brightness is also a really interesting one. This one is in a similar vein to the LED toggling attack, except um, this is done in software by just toggling the brightness of the screen and then decoding that later. A hmm. um, little bit ridiculous, but also cool. Hmm. All right, so over on my screen, we have a, a pretty typical social media attack that is currently underway. So if you have an Instagram account, you should be on the lookout for this one because a lot of people are falling for it. So this attack is relying on people's enthusiasm for getting a like blue verification badge, which I assume is the same as on Twitter. And in their clamor to try to get their verification badge, it looks like they are accidentally filling out this badge form, which asks for their password. So this badge form is definitely not legitimate. It is something that is just designed to try to get people's information. Um, and because of that, people have filled this out. Oh, here's the badge form itself your name, your email, your phone number, you continue, and then it asks you for your password. And then look at that, you have, it says you got verified, congratulations, but oh. instead they actually just stole your entire account. Um, so that's pretty funny. And that is, this is absolutely not the way that Instagram badges work. They don't like hit you up and just tell you that you're like qualified. So uh, there are definitely some indicators that this attack is a scam, but I would say it, it is not, um, not that sophisticated. It really is just relying on people clamoring to do this. Uh, without really checking the details. Oh, oh, and then also somebody in the chat was asking, is this a podcast? Is this just like a live chilling show? This show is called Hacking with Friends. So we're basically going over the hacking news on Friday and taking questions and just talking about technology news for about an hour or so, which is uh, fun. Uh, so another thing that's really difficult is hard-coded credentials. Like if you've ever developed a piece of software, you know that in tests, you'll often maybe have something hard-coded that is easier to remember than like generating something live or omitting it. And oftentimes when an application is fully developed, it doesn't <laughs> go through certain security checks to make sure that these are completely sanitized. And as a result of that, uh, there are some pretty serious problems, especially with business to business providers who are setting up services for other companies and then ending up accidentally exposing like truly frightening information. So they went through and found business to business company providing internet, so like internal services, to 15,000 medium to large companies. Um, and it was basically showing all private customer data stored on the platform to anybody who wanted to look at it. 
Uh, another uh, was a third party digital identi identity and authentication uh, used by banks that included uh, valid cloud credentials that could show names, dates of birth, and even biometric fingerprint scans um, yes. all exposed to the cloud. And then they also found a sports betting technology platform uh, that was exposing its entire infrastructure and cloud services with admin level read and write permissions. If you like, I don't know if that's like secretly a honeypot or if they're just like begging for a ransomware attack, but it doesn't take a very sophisticated threat actor to find hard coded credentials and just go in and just wipe it, you know, or like copy stuff down, double exploitation attack. Like that's, that's exactly how this stuff kind of, kind of happens. Um, so yeah, just another example of like, for one, hard coded credentials. And then for two, maybe companies having their data in places where they're not totally sure who has access to it. So like maybe somebody else could get access to it very easily and they wouldn't even know. That's definitely a hard position for these companies to be in. And it is just another sign of how important it is to go through security checks when you're developing a mobile application, because these sorts of things are really, really serious when uh, they are missed and put into production. Yeah, it's fairly common. Uh, there's like lots of tools that are made specifically for like scraping GitHub for like some of these secrets. Because lots of times I've I've made this mistake myself as well. Um, lots of times like developers might accidentally push like an API key or in this case, uh, hard coded AWS credentials directly to like production repositories. And it's fairly easy to just like scrape through and like find that stuff. Um, since you can like parse using like regex for a particular um, secret key for a framework or something like AWS or something like that. Mm -hmm. you know? um, luckily, um, some services like GitHub are trying to crack down on that and automatically like flag. Um, if it detects that you've pushed one of these like secret keys or something like that. Um, so that is good, but it's still fairly common. Yeah. So did you want to talk about GitHub scraping or I got oh, I don't have one pulled up. Okay, I don't have that pulled up, but I can cool, talk cool. about the news that I have here. Before. Yeah. Um, well, let me go through this first. So, uh, so one thing that has been an interesting development is a bug that allows you to write to a clipboard without permission. So this might not seem like a big deal, but it actually can be leveraged in a couple interesting attacks. And Google Chrome is actually currently vulnerable to this. And while it's been noted as a problem, um, a fix is not available yet. So I can actually demonstrate this uh, and see what it looks like. So right now I'm just gonna copy what's the big deal. And if I paste that, you know, that's that's pretty predictable. So if I was, for example, going and copying like bank account information or like some other like really long number, maybe a cryptocurrency wallet address, then I would rely on my system's clipboard to reliably copy and paste. So what's the big deal is what is currently in my clipboard. What if I was filling out a form or something like that? And I'm gonna go over to Chrome and then to this website, Web Platform News. And I'm going to refresh it. And now if I try to paste the message I had again, I can see platform news in a browser allows website to try the clipboard without the user. Sorry for the inconvenience. This has happened to me like yeah. a lot. Yeah. So what's happened here is actually the browser took the information that I had in the clipboard, erased it, and put in its own information. So if I was filling out a form here and I was copying and pasting information into it, I could very easily have a piece of that information be modified without me knowing. So that's why this is such a potent attack. And this doesn't work on Firefox, uh, at least when I, I tested it just before the stream, but it does work on Google Chrome. So if you want to test this out yourself, this website allows you to, to very quickly see whether or not a web platform new, uh, web platform news is the website if you want to try it out yourself. Take a, you know, take a string, uh, put it in your clipboard, and then see if this website can overwrite that string. So what was noted here is that there's a lot of different um, browsers that allow this feature of being able to write into your clipboard. Um, and, and frequently you'll see this as like something where you click on like a button to share and it says like, you know, whatever copied the clipboard. That's great. Like uh, if it gives you a little pop up, but because that's not required, uh, there's very poor security all around this particular feature. And it's been leveraged in some very interesting ways by attackers to make people think that they're inputting one thing when in fact they're inputting something totally different. So interesting little bug with browsers that again has not been fixed so this is currently uh like a, a i guess a bug or a vulnerability that google has noted as a security issue and will probably be patched in the future but as of right now it is still a dangerously unprotected feature which can be abused in a number of interesting ways all right you want to go yep probably yeah cool so this is a demonstration of how two different passwords can be used on the same zip file, which at a first glance looks like a hash collision. 
what is actually a pretty interesting flaw or I guess feature in how certain zip archiving programs are um, hashing or like encrypting their passwords. So a security researcher, I'm not gonna try to pronounce this name, um, noticed that if you use a password that's over 64 bits, in this case, um, never gonna give you up, never gonna <laughs> let you down, never gonna desert you, but in leet text, um, this also collided with this uh, hash here that could also be used in order to decrypt the zip file. So exactly what was going on here is um, hmm. certain applications like 7-zip in this case, um, just have a 64-bit buffer. Um, so basically, if you were to input a password that's over, um, I think it's bits, bytes, I forget. If it's over 64 characters, um, basically what it does is it will hash this text and then instead use that as the password. Hmm. Of course, this is um, this still goes through further encryption methods. Um, so this doesn't exactly um, provide a... This isn't exactly like an attack vector or a vulnerability or anything, but it is interesting to see that two different passwords are able to work with the same zip archive simply because of the length of uh, this password. But wait, but the password is a hash, sorry, the second password is the hash of the first password? Yeah, so it takes, huh. if it's too long, it will just take the original password, hash it to this, and then also um, encrypt this slash hash it with, I think, like SHA-256. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. But, but but essentially, the two passwords that are accepted are the yeah. password and then a salted hash of that password. Yeah. Essentially. So, so then it's not when exactly... it goes, yeah, when it goes to compare it, if you like input your really long password, then it notices, oh, this is longer than 64 bytes or 64 characters, rather, then it hashes it and then it does the comparison again. So. <laughs> I thought that was pretty weird. Uh, that's a weird quirk of just like the way that technology like validates, I guess. Yeah. All right. So over on my screen, we have an interesting case of the U.S. government selling a data broker for selling sensitive geolocation data um, in an effort to just turn a profit on being able to let everyone know where people have been. So this is something that with a $25,000 subscription uh, would allow anybody buying this data set to be able to log people's locations um to things like healthcare or mental health places and this obviously is pretty concerning because it could be used to be sold to insurance providers and other people that would affect people's ability to get healthcare or ability to get a job or even physical violence in the case of somebody who is stalking and we did see some cases where people at police agencies were using these sorts of systems to get the location of you know former partners you know or or like or, or other people where they did not have permission to be tracking them. They just wanted to look in on their locations. And often these weren't caught until they were you know, reviewed in some fluke or like otherwise something went back and like managed to catch it at, like much after it had happened. So these sorts of systems generally do not have very good oversight in the agencies that do purchase subscriptions, um, which is a big problem because these sorts of things can be used to track all sorts of behavior and really like healthcare and mental health care is one of the most sensitive ones. So now because they've been sued, this company has decided that they're going to introduce privacy block, which is somehow magically uh, going to hide um, where people go uh, for healthcare, receive counseling or celebrate their faith. Um, so my hope is that this legal pressure is going to make more companies realize they can't be selling the sort of like super private data about like where where people go to church where people go for their health care um that sort of thing obviously you don't want shared with things like your insurance provider who might jack up your rates like because they see that maybe you go and receive a lot of health care or have a chronic condition or something like that uh, this really does impact people's ability to you know exercise their rights and have some sort of expectation of privacy um when they're entering into a business agreement and that person they're entering into an agreement with might already know everything about them and be able to like price things unfairly. Um, there's a lot of different implications here for privacy. And I'm personally really happy the US government is stepping in to try to limit the sort of commercial tracking because not a lot of care is really given to the people who have access to this data once it's collected. That reminds me of uh, this piece that also came out recently. I didn't get to look too much into this. Maybe we'll cover it um, next week, but this uh, company called Fog, I believe Fog Data, Mm -hmm. um, is basically making similar like geolocation stuff very accessible to like the police um, and stuff like that by just providing a s really cheap service that allows them to like gather that. geolocation data. Um, there you go. Yeah. To gather geolocation data um, and basically like pinpoint the location of 
devices and where people are um, just based off like regular applications that are already harvesting this data um, in your like everyday use, like um, stuff that you're opening up in your web browser, social media, stuff like that. But basically this company, uh, Fog Reveal, harvests this data and they make it super cheap and accessible um, for law enforcement to be able to gather reconnaissance on people through this sleek interface that's basically just like Google Maps. So this is really terrifying. Um, looks like the EFF is digging into this and probably taking some legal action. Yeah, so but, what's scary here is like the cops can do a geofenced request, which basically right. gets the location data of anybody who's in a specific place at a specific time. So they could just say your address. And then anybody who's on the premises, they can also then build a profile of everywhere else that they've been and determine like what kind of person they are, where they work, where they go to school, what kinds of healthcare services they seek out. Like all that is like very easy for uh, somebody to find just by placing you in a specific place at a specific time and then making a query for, you know, devices that were in that area. So this sort of like super invasive surveillance that does not require a warrant and has very, very poor transparency and internal oversight is a huge threat to privacy and, and being able to expect that, you know, anybody who's connect, even loosely connected to these sorts of agencies would be able to see your every movement. This is a big problem for that. So that's why so many people are upset about this. And that's why the EFF is taking legal action to limit it. Yeah, scary stuff. So this is an interesting uh, story. DuckDuckGo has opened its private privacy-focused email service to anyone. So if you've been clamoring for an at Duck email account, I saw this. I uh, want to get that email address just so I could have. Yeah, I tried. I tried to do that too. <laughs> so um, I wanted to go ahead and sign up, but when you're signing up, you actually have to install this like uh, like add-on or like extension, and I am still trying to figure out why I want that on my computer. Um, so the point of this is like, it's supposed to do like proprietary blocking of like trackers and lots of emails come with trackers and like the fact that they are trying to like strip these trackers out and let you know how many trackers are removed from each email. That's pretty cool. Why do I need the extension? Why can't I sign up for this email address without getting the extension? Um, do I like, why do I want the extension? Sell me on it. Like I'll, I'll consider it. Um, but I still don't get it. So maybe someone could explain it to me, but like the, the whole thing here, um, uh, is they're trying to bundle this all together as like one thing, uh, and make it so that, you know, about all the trackers that were removed. But I, again, what, what, why, why do I need the DuckDuckGo mobile app? Why do I need this? Why can't I just access it from like a normal web browser without an extension? Um, again, per perhaps somebody could tell me what the big deal is but when i try to just like sign up for a free email address and i was presented with the the need to uh install their browser extension i was like you got to sell me on that too now because <laughs> like i'm just yeah. not going to install random browser extensions on my computer like i need to know like what it's doing so um yeah not a huge fan of the need for that but maybe i just didn't read this enough it is very wordy and we're on like five pages here um i'm sure that i'm sure this is all very valuable information it's all but... worth it for that dot duck domain yeah i know i really do want the at duck domain um uh, so i'm i might go through with it just so i have one but like i'm a little disappointed that i have to like invest in their like whole ecosystem just to get yeah. a duck domain all right we're coming up on our time do you have anything else you want to share on your end uh yeah just really quickly i'll just cover these uh last three little things here another repository that i found that's a compilation of cool web hacking tools um if any of you guys are interested in that this is a pretty solid thorough resource. Um, two of these piqued my interest, this first one here called Hetty, which seems to be a really sleek, streamlined interface um, that's basically an HTTP proxy that's sort of similar to other tools out there like Midim proxy um, and some smaller tools that are included um, in full suites like Burp Suite or OWASP SAP. Um, but this one is particularly focused on the web aspect um, of sniffing like HTTP packets um, and has this nice sleek interface here, which I think is personally nicer than um, like Midim proxy. Um, I haven't used like a wasp or burp, but I know that you have. Hmm. Um, I thought this was pretty cool. If any of you guys are interested in that. And then also uh, Rengen, which I'll look more into some other time. This looked like a pretty cool web application reconnaissance tool. You can see it has a whole bunch of pretty cool features packed into this. Um, can do a lot of cool reconnaissance stuff look for vulnerabilities, um, also web application tool, looks cool. Yeah, 
That's all I got. Nice. All right. So one person also mentions you can download the app and then delete it afterwards. It's a, a email forwarder, not an actual email address for the at duck account. That makes sense. Like it, it, it did seem like they were just trying to be like a pass through to be able to like eliminate like trackers and stuff, which is cool. But it also means like you have access to the contents of all the emails that are going through there. So I was just like, what else are you doing? I know you're a privacy focused company, but like what, like just giving an extension access to my email or whatever just seems a little weird, but well, I guess, yeah. I guess we'll see. All right, so that's all the time that we have for today. There's only a couple stories we didn't get to talk about. So uh, we'll have some more on for next week on Friday. If you're just checking us out for the first time, then make sure to subscribe to the channel so you can catch us every week. We go live on Wednesdays for our Q&A, and we also go live on Friday for our new stream. So hopefully we'll see you next time. And also, as always, a big shout out to our sponsor, Veronis, that lets us do the Hacking with Friends show every week. It's really fun to get to uh, be able to hang out with my friends, uh, all of you, and also Alex, and talk about hacking stuff each week. So thank you very much to them, and we will see you next week. Bye.